Hi, I'm Dr. Birgit Breidenbach and I'm a lecturer in Literature and Philosophy at the University of East Anglia. Welcome to my lockdown lecture on the question, who's in charge of our emotions? To give you a bit of context, my research focuses on emotions and moods, and I'm particularly interested in the kinds of moods and emotions that go beyond the individual person and affect multiple people or entire communities. This lecture was originally planned as part of the lecture series Crisis and Control, which is a public lecture series at the University of East Anglia. Unfortunately, the lecture series was affected by the UCU strike earlier this year and then obviously the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, so I'm really glad and fortunate to be able to give this lecture in a digital format um, for you to enjoy in the comfort and safety of your homes. I want to begin by discussing what emotions have to do with crisis and control. In 2018, the political economist William Davies published a book titled Nervous States, How Feelings Took Over the World. As the title of the book indicates, Davies argues that in the so-called post-truth age, politics is governed by feelings much more so than by reason. He explains this in relation to the decline of the Enlightenment paradigm of uh, rationality. And given the recent rise of populism in Europe and the United States and elsewhere, as well as the proliferation of so-called fake news and the new forms of political interaction um, and participation that technology has enabled in recent times, it is very easy to find many examples of um, Davis's argument. Davies summarizes his argument by writing, democracies are being transformed by the power of feeling in ways that cannot be ignored or reversed. Separating rationality from emotion is no longer possible. This is our reality now. Other political theorists, including my UEA colleague um, Alan Finlayson, have similarly argued that political rhetoric now relies on um, the existence of affective communities, that is, communities that are brought together by shared forms of feeling rather than shared interests. Um, a prominent example of this in the British context is obviously the Brexit referendum um, and the clearly emotional way in which people have talked about it, debated it and experienced it. A huge part of the Brexit rhetoric um, aimed at creating feelings of fear or outrage. The aftermath of the referendum too was very emotional and depending on where people stood they felt either very depressed or very joyful. More recently in the drawn out Brexit negotiations um, a new phenomenon known as Brexit fatigue has emerged. In this day and age, our engagement with politics is thus driven by emotions, and critics such as Davies and Finlayson see this as part of a larger ongoing process and transformation of politics. So what has caused this? Davies argues that the Enlightenment ideal of rationality, and with it our trust in experts, has actually been in decline over the course of um, recent centuries. Another important factor is the emergence of the internet and the growing sense of um, how social media interferes in politics. Through social media we've developed a new participatory model of politics. Anybody can now publicly voice their opinion and their feelings via social media and thus participate in political discussions. Apps such as Twitter allow public sentiments and feelings to actually spread like wildfire. But this can also be problematic. While social media enables an unprecedented level of political participation, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal of 2018 has shown that social media platforms are not innocent vehicles for political discussion, but that they have the capacity to significantly interfere with democratic processes. It has come to light that as part of the 2016 US presidential campaign, Cambridge Analytica harvested the personal data of millions of Facebook users and strategically targeted persuadable voters with adverts to change their voting behaviour. Many of these adverts promulgated fake news stories aiming at creating fear and mistrust. Although Cambridge Analytica have denied any open involvement with the Brexit campaign, it's also strongly suspected that they had a huge impact on the outcome of the Brexit referendum. What we can gather from these examples is that emotions and feelings play a huge role in contemporary politics. 
but I think we also can agree that we need a better understanding of how this operates and how this functions. What we need is a clearer understanding of how our feelings can be incited, directed and manipulated. The implications of this question for our sense of democracy are really far-reaching and potentially worrying. If our emotions are crucial for the ways in which we navigate not only politics but society in general, the question, who's in charge of our emotions, becomes even more pressing. So far I've focused on a particular aspect of the question, which is that of the external manipulation of our feelings. But there is an even deeper and longer standing philosophical question at stake here as well, which is the question of whether we are in control of our emotions in the first place. So by extension, the question in the first place is, do we control our emotions or do they perhaps control us? To start with, it looks as though we might be able to answer the initial question, who's in charge of our emotions, in three different ways. Number one, we are in charge of our emotions. Number two, we're not in charge of our emotions, they are in charge of us. Number three, external factors, including politics, the media, social media, etc., are in control of our emotions. For the remainder of this talk, I want to discuss these potential options and answers in relation to insights from psychology and philosophy. The place of emotions in philosophy is a contested subject matter, especially for a discipline that fashions itself and prides itself in its reliance on rationality rather than feelings or emotions. Many of the great philosophers of the Western tradition have thought of emotions as something that gets in the way of reason, something that hinders intellectual activity and rational decision making. Think, for instance, of the now somewhat old-fashioned term, the passions. We associate it with someone being swept off their feet, unable to act in a rational way and unable to control their behaviour. To Plato, one of the founders of Western philosophy, the emotions are associated with the body, which is a lesser part of the human being than the rational soul. In The Republic, the character Socrates therefore argues that poetry nourishes the passions and emotions and because of that, its pursuit ought to be discouraged. Similarly, the German Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant argues to be subject to affects and passions is probably always an illness of the mind because both affect and passion shut out the sovereignty of reason. So while reason is thought to be within the reach of our control, emotions are thought as a disturbance to the rational mind, as something that temporarily takes charge of the individual and dims their reasonable faculties. Kant later compares such feelings and the actions that they produce to a drunkenness that one sleeps off. Like a drunk person, someone enveloped in their emotions seems to have a reduced sense of self-control and might act out of character. Traditionally, philosophy thus thinks of reason and emotions as polar opposites. The French philosopher Hélène Sixou has observed that oppositional pairs, whether it's man and woman, young and old, or culture and nature are always structured through a hierarchical relationship in which one of the two has the upper hand. In the binary structure of reason and emotion it is clear to see that reason has held the upper hand for a long time. And on a side note, historically speaking reason has always been associated with the male gender and emotion obviously with the female gender. One example for this association is the history of the concept of hysteria and the fact that the word hysteria itself is derived from the Greek word for uterus. There is a very gender dimension to the way we think about emotions, but that's perhaps a topic for a different video. So there's essentially a notion of reason and emotion as diametrical opposites, with reason being the higher faculty and emotion being the lower faculty. Emotion is therefore often seen as an unnecessary disturbance to the human mind. The Stoic philosophers, for instance, thought of emotions, especially those caused by erratic judgments, as undesirable disturbances to the reasonable faculties, and therefore the ability to keep emotions in check was of paramount importance to them. The idea that emotions get in the way of reason and that they are beyond the realm of our control is still really strongly ingrained in the way in which we talk about emotions or think about emotions. We can, for example, see this idea reflected in the legal context in the term crime of passion. 
where there is a sense of reduced accountability or responsibility for a crime committed out of a strong emotion that seemingly overcame the individual who committed the crime. What is implied here is the idea that because an emotion seemingly took over a person, they have a reduced sense of accountability for the crime. The idea is also that they would have acted differently and obviously more reasonably if they hadn't been overcome by that emotion. However, an increasing amount of philosophers have actually contested the idea that emotions are irrational and therefore beyond the scope of our control. The so-called cognitive theory of emotion has been very popular in Anglo-American philosophy since the 1950s and it has been advocated by philosophers such as Martha Nussbaum and Robert C. Solomon. According to this theory, emotions do have cognitive content, meaning that they are not merely physical sensations, but conscious cognitive content that is linked to existing beliefs and desires. What this means is that according to the cognitive theory, emotions are not just something that happens to the body, but actually something that is conscious and reflected and part of mental operations. It is therefore linked to thoughts, judgments and decision-making. Solomon writes, Emotions are not occurrences and do not happen to us. I would like to suggest that emotions are rational and purposive rather than irrational and disruptive, are very much like actions and that we choose an emotion much as we choose a cause of action. Solomon argues that emotions are not something that just overcomes us and takes charge of us. He believes that emotions are judgments that we can make and that they are therefore well within the realm of our control. We choose emotions for specific purposes and to attain specific goals. Here is an example that Solomon gives. Joni wants to go to a party. Her husband does not. She begins to act bored and frustrated. He watches television. She resigns herself to reading, sighing occasionally. He asks if she has picked up some shirts from the laundry. She says no. He flies into a rage. He needs shirts. He has hundreds. He needs one of those. They are all the same. She is negligent. She was busy. She takes advantage of him. She stays with him. Naturally, she rebels. But she's upset with mixed guilt and anger. She thinks him unreasonable, impossible and slightly neurotic. Their encounter is short-lived. She goes off to read. He settles back before the television. The party is out of the question. Solomon suggests that in this example, which by the way relies on some problematic gender stereotypes, but that aside, he suggests that the husband's anger is not merely a reaction, but a choice. Solomon says that the husband has used his anger to manipulate his wife and to achieve the purpose of not having to go to the party. In this sense, the husband's anger is one option out of multiple um, that he could have taken to resolve the situation. Solomon acknowledges that the husband may not be conscious of what he's doing, but he maintains that the husband still chose anger over other options for resolving the situation, and that the emotion of anger is therefore a choice rather than something that just overcomes the husband in that situation. One important thing to note here is that the cognitive theory relies on the distinction between physical stimuli or sensations on the one hand and emotions as reflected modes of experiencing feelings on the other hand. So for example, you might feel a tingle on your hand or in your skin, um, and in that case we'd be speaking of a sensation or a physical stimulus. As opposed to this, the conscious experience of this feeling would be the emotion of nervousness. So if you become consciously aware of your nerve and of the tingling, you've given that emotion a name, you call it nervousness. You might also identify and rationalize the cause of the nervousness. For instance, if you're waiting to go into a job interview, you might then put the emotion and the sensation together with the context and name that emotion um, within the context of the job interview. In this sense, emotions are thought to differ from physical stimuli in the sense that they are conscious mental content rather than just embodied or felt stimuli. As the name of the theory indicates, the cognitive theory privileges the cognitive side of emotion, but there's also a range of other theories of emotion and philosophy as well as psychology, many of which privilege the physiological dimension, that is, the physical stimuli and sensations through which emotions occur to us. One of the most prominent physiological theories of emotion is the so-called James Lange theory, 
named after the 19th century scholars William James and Karl Lange. According to this theory, physiological stimuli give rise to emotions. In his famous essay, What is an Emotion?, William James writes, Common sense says we lose our fortune, are sorry and weep. We meet a bear, are frightened and run. We are insulted by a rival, are angry and strike. The hypothesis here to be defended says that this order of sequence is incorrect, that the one mental state is not immediately induced by the other, that the bodily manifestations must first be interposed between, and that the more rational statement is that we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, afraid because we tremble, and not that we cry, strike or tremble because we are sorry, angry or fearful, as the case may be. Without the bodily states following on the perception, the latter would be purely cognitive in form, pale, colourless, destitute of emotional warmth. We might then see the bear and judge it best to run, receive the insult and deem it right to strike, but we could not actually feel afraid or angry. So according to James, emotions are produced by physiological stimuli and the physical sensation of a feeling precedes the conscious experience of that feeling. I don't see a bear and feel fear I see a bear, I tremble, and then I realize that I am feeling fear. It's easy to see why the cognitive theory of emotions would be at odds with the James Lange theory. One privileges the cognitive dimension of emotion, the other the physiological. One sees emotions as situated in the conscious mind, the other sees their primary appearance in the feeling body. One views emotion as a cognitive judgment and a choice the other as a knee-jerk reaction to physical stimuli. One suggests that we can take charge of our emotions and the other suggests that our bodies simply react and respond to given stimuli. But both of them have remained influential in contemporary debates about the nature of emotion. In fact, many variations of these theories, as well as criticisms of them, have emerged over the course of the past decades. It would be beyond the scope of this video to discuss these in detail, because there are a lot, but I will put some titles of books that might be of interest to you um, into the end of this video if you want to have a look. I think both theories do have merit, but I also take issue with some implications in both theories. Looking at the cognitive theory, I would say that it puts a lot of faith in each person's capacity to make conscious emotional decisions and choices. Also, the cognitive theory, I think, neglects the really important role of the physiological dimension of emotion. At the same time, the physiological theory seems to rely on historically invariable, universal reactions to given stimuli. And it essentially takes us back to the idea that emotions are more or less instinctive reactions to the world around us. So that's also not a very satisfactory answer to the question, are we in charge of our emotions? What I find problematic about both of them is that they rely on a split between body and mind, between emotion and sensation, which is perhaps unhelpful in its adherence to Cartesian philosophy. Most importantly, I think both theories place a very strong emphasis on the role of emotion in individual people, and both of them threaten to neglect the role of collective forms of feeling and of social factors in the way in which we experience emotions and respond to them. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, our feelings and emotions are intertwined with a much bigger collective framework, which has considerable influence on the way we feel. In the final part of this talk, I want to focus on this entanglement between our individual emotions and wider social factors. Although Western culture has obviously held the concept of the individual in very high regard throughout the modern age, we cannot deny that we are all part of the wider social collective. Some philosophers have assigned a particularly important role to the social sphere in the formation of the individual. A prominent example of this being the philosophy of Karl Marx. Marx thought of the individual self as being determined completely by social forces. But even if you're skeptical of this idea, none of us can fail to acknowledge that, to paraphrase the words of the famous poet John Donne, no person is an island. In actual fact, the myth of the individual, 
of each and every one of us having this fixed internal and hermetically sealed core of being at the center which pre-exists and then enters into the world and interacts with the world in a sort of secondary move has been identified as a historically limited mode of self-interpretation as the philosopher Charles Taylor writes in his famous book Sources of the Self. Although we are of course individuals and each of us has a private life this individuality is much more entangled and caught up with society than much of modern philosophy likes to admit. One of the most fundamental ways in which we participate in this collective life is of course language. It is the principal form through which we express ourselves and communicate and it is also the main form in which we express our emotions. Solomon, who I previously mentioned, argues that through language culture predisposes us to experience and understand our emotions in certain ways. Our language, our concepts and our conceptions of emotions are intimately linked with, pervade and define the emotions themselves. Whether a person labels her hostile feelings hatred, anger or resentment, for example, makes quite a difference in how she will express, evaluate, think about and talk about her emotion. Consider, for example, a situation in which someone else's words or actions have upset you or made you feel bad. And consider what a difference it makes to label the feeling that you're experiencing as disappointment, hurt, anger or disgust. As Solomon argues, not only does the word you use to name an emotion articulate it in a certain way, your own perception of the emotion will be affected and the way you might act on it will also change. Emotions are far from being eternal and universal. They are concepts that arise in specific cultural contexts and are closely tied to the fabric of language itself. Just think about emotions for which there are only words in certain languages, such as the English awkward, the French ennui or the German schadenfreude. Language and the cultural understanding of an emotion shape and even predetermine how each person makes sense of and communicates their emotions. Not only will the cultural context predetermine the kinds of emotions that we will experience and identify, cultural factors also have a huge bearing on the way we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Consider, for example, the current COVID-19 crisis. It's virtually impossible to disentangle our emotions from those of the wider public, even if we are not currently participating in the public in a physical sense, perhaps. The public mood, as it were, still comes to us in various ways, through broadcast media and social media. In the UK, the Queen addressed the nation in a special broadcast about COVID-19 on the 5th of April. And this was watched by 24 million viewers. Also, the government have sent a letter signed by the Prime Minister to all households in the country. Wherever you are in the world right now, print, broadcast and online media are reporting on the crisis on a daily basis and governments are giving oftentimes daily briefings about the current situation. All of this will have an impact on the way you feel, whether you like it or not, and the public conversation about the crisis will likely continue to affect the way you feel while the crisis continues. Likewise, of course, your interactions with your nearest and dearest, whether you're physically close to them or not, will impact how you feel. Their emotions, concerns and well-being are closely connected to the way that you yourself feel. One facet of the current crisis that I find quite fascinating is the phenomenon of panic buying. And I find it fascinating um, in, a, in a quite disturbing sense. It begins with just one person thinking that they will need 20 packets of toilet roll. And then the next person sees that and thinks, oh my, there won't be any toilet roll left, so I better buy some more right now. And then that sense of panic and fear and concern can spread like wildfire, to an extent where that emotion itself seems to be something that's almost contagious. The 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza was intrigued by this precise, contagious nature of emotion, on which he writes, Affects are contagious. Each subject is disposed to desire what she perceives others, whom she regards as similar to herself, desiring. As a result, each subject is disposed to imitate the affects of others generally. 
I believe that this collective and oftentimes contagious dimension of emotions is really important to the way in which our emotions are entangled with the wider public. It also means that you're never in complete control of your own emotions because they are so closely tied up with the ebb and flow of public emotions. On a broader scale, we could call this phenomenon the public mood, or in German, Zeitgeist. Contemporary theorist Sarah Ahmed argues that these shared feelings are crucial vehicles for the politics of citizenship. Citizenship becomes a requirement to be sympathetic, as an agreement with feeling. To be a sympathetic part is to agree with your heart. After all, who could fail to be touched by the endlessly repeated images of the young queen coming to the throne after the death of her father? Who could fail to be touched by the memory of the young prince following the coffin of his dead mother? Here, being touched into citizenship is to be touched by the trauma of a past and the prospect of its conversion. Being a citizen, being part of a community, means to share in the collective feelings that circulate within that community. None of us can help but experience our own emotions in relation to those wider developments and collective sentiments. But that also doesn't mean that we are just passive victims of public feelings and that they will just overcome us no matter what we do. After all, we're not all panic buyers, or at least I hope that we aren't. In my view, what's most important about an entanglement with collective emotions is to become more cognizant of it. To understand the ways in which the media, politics, the economy, social media and myriad other factors impinge on the way we feel. Since scholars believe that emotion plays such a huge role in contemporary politics, and I think it's fair to say that it's not only politics, but the complete social sphere, it is all the more important to become cognizant of how these emotions impact us. So, who is in charge of our emotions? I would say that it's complicated and that philosophy does not have a single answer to this question. However, how we choose to answer it has huge implications for a number of philosophical areas, including, of course, that of moral philosophy. There is beyond doubt a physiological dimension of feeling, which is perhaps beyond the reach of our consciousness and therefore beyond the reach of our control. There is also a huge cultural influence, not only on the way we think about our emotions, conceptualize them and make sense of them, but on the way that we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. The danger in this lies in the fact that others have the capacity to manipulate our emotions, be that for political reasons or others. But at the same time, we as individual people can make choices about our emotions, especially the way in which we articulate them and the way in which we act on them. Most importantly, I think we need to understand how these emotions function, how they are tied into it, a wider collective sense of emotion and last but not least and I hope this video has given you some incentive to do this um, to reflect on our own understanding and experience of our emotions that is the assumptions that we make about them and the place that we give them in our lives thank you very much for watching this video I do hope that you found it interesting and I'd like to thank my colleague Tom Greaves from the Department of Philosophy at the University of East Anglia as well as Julian Beghini from the Royal Institute of Philosophy for inviting me to do this lockdown lecture. Take care everybody and stay safe.